started. And just to give you a preview of why I put this together today and why I'm going to be posting it out there is because I started with Team Hired three years ago yesterday. So this is my, my third year anniversary. And I came from a completely different background. I didn't come from recruiting. I didn't come from a hiring space. Yet I had recruited and hired myself as a, as a manager. You know, I came from a space where I was doing sales consulting. I was a sales guy for many, many years in a lot of different industries. And when I came into Team Hired, I came in just with my ears open and my heart open to say, what, what is it that I can learn about this? So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today has to do with how to effectively you know, build a hiring process into your company. But it's also about how to create long-term success for the people that you end up hiring. And that starts all the way with the interviews. It happens on the second interview. It happens in the way that you onboard them. And it happens in a long-term path of, of how you set your team up for success. So being within Team Hired, I've been able to learn underneath the tutelage of uh, Dave Williams and Tom Bianco, who, if you guys don't know, you know, as founders of Team Hired, years ago, they weren't involved in the hiring space either. I mean, they were hiring, but they were agency owners and they had both grown 20 plus million dollar agencies from, from nothing and had to learn a lot of the hard knocks themselves. And so I've learned a ton from them. And I've also learned a ton from our, our clients and from our team. Uh, we've got Ashley Buster with us. Ashley, great to see you. So, so Ashley has been with Team Hired for a long time and she's worked with hundreds, if not maybe actually thousands of clients over the years. And there's a lot of information that flows back through our team about what's working for clients and what's not working. And sometimes that's in the form of a victory that somebody hit the nail on the head and successfully hired, you know, somebody very quality. They, they got a, you know, situation that is just hasn't buzzing, right? They just had a successful hire, successful onboarding, everything's going perfect. And then other times it comes in the form of a failure. It, it comes in the form of something not going right. And we've been able to look at hundreds of situations where we need to tweak things or get things on track for a client. And it's taught us a lot about the market. Um, it's real-time feedback about what's working and what's not working. So if you have run into a hire in the past six months, the last year, last two years that maybe didn't work out, you know, some of that is out of your control, right? And I'm going to be talking about that, but a lot of it is very much within your control. So again, the goal of today is to blaze through a lot of information. Um, with this couple minute introduction here, I hope you guys are ready to kind of buckle up and roll because I'm going to be going through a lot. And then I'll send the recording out that you can obviously go into later. And then last but not least, then we'll get started. Please drop questions into the chat. I'll be monitoring that throughout today's session. And I'll be answering your questions either at the end or as we go, just depending on how they fit in. So without further ado, let me just kind of dive into this. You know, one of the first things I want to talk about is I call it mega agent hiring tactics or process tactics. And this has to do with what I see that large agencies, agencies that maybe weren't always large, but they've grown to be sizable and they've successfully hired and retained people. You know, what are they doing that might be different? What are they doing to capitalize on the market right now that people should be aware of? Um, and I'm just going to go kind of bullet by bullet on some of these. And then we're going to get into how to source candidates. We're going to get in how to, how to screen and interview candidates. Uh, we're going to get into how to set expectations for new hires. Uh, we're going to get into compensation. Then we're going to transition into uh, employee onboarding, talk a little bit about remote hiring, a uh, little bit about accountability. And then I've got some, some Easter eggs, if you will, at the tail end for you. So diving right in, one of the things that we believe in at Team Hired is, is in utilizing a different way to vet candidates. And the process, if you're familiar with our company, which I know many of you are, is going to be mainly utilizing group interviews as our vetting phase. And I always like to compare what we do to what an average agency might do for themselves. I think for an average agency, they're going to go out and they're going to spend a certain amount of money to go generate interested candidates in their position. And then the second stage is they're probably going to kind of call through that list and they're going to set up potentially one-on-one -on -one phone interviews with them or maybe Zoom interviews and sort of go through one candidate at a time. And there's nothing inherently wrong about that other than the fact that it takes a lot of time. And when you think about your time throughout a week, you're not just hiring, 
you're also managing marketing, managing a team, managing clients. And those all require your attention and your energy as well. And what I've seen happen in a lot of businesses, and I've, I've been uh, guilty of this myself, is that my hiring goes on a lot longer than it needs to. Uh, because at the end of the day, you're probably not going to hire the first person you talk to. That could happen. But more than likely, you're going to need to talk with three or five or 10 or whatever it is to actually find the quality that you're looking for. And when you think about that from the respect of doing one phone interview at a time, you're also running up against this other thing, which is no shows and disengaged people and people that you know, might engage with you all the way through to an offer and disappear. So when you start running the math and you're like, wow, I can't just talk with one person. I might need to talk with five or 10 people. Well, as soon as you get into trying to do this manually, one person at a time, it starts to stretch your hiring timeline out. And the longer that timeline is, the longer you have that open position, which means loss production. The other thing it does is it drains your energy away from things that you could be doing within the agency. And so if you think about it, compare candidates to sales leads for a minute. Let's kind of transition here. If you look at a candidate like a sales lead, you know in your sales funnel that there's certain conversion metrics. You know you need a certain number of phone calls to get to a certain number of quotes to get to a certain number of policies. And if your close rates and things average out, you're going to end up with about as many policies as the activity that you put in. So if we do the same thing on the, the hiring side and we say we need a certain number of candidates to approve for a second interview, and we need a certain number of second interviews to get an offer, and we need a certain number of offers to get to a hire, we can play the same game and utilize these group interviews to essentially go in and put four, six, eight, 10 people in front of the agency. And I'm not here uh, to, to plug Team Hire. We're definitely here to help. But I'm here to just talk about the method of group interviews real quick because it's something that Dave and Tom figured out years ago. Um, they actually used to do it in person at their offices. And they would get more interviews done in one day than most agencies would do in a couple of weeks or sometimes even a month. And so they were able to get to more second interviews faster because of the law of averages. You know, if I talk to 10 people, I'm probably going to like maybe two to three of them that could move forward in my process. And I can either stretch that out and I can talk to one person at a time for the next two to three weeks and deal with no shows and all of that. Or I can go ahead and I can invite 15, 20 people to come meet with me in a group setting. And we can eliminate from there and still end up with the same number of second interviews. Um, and so this is, you know, something that I learned being within Team Hired. And being on the other end of that, you know, I see the value in it because we call it ripping off the Band-Aid. If you can get through that first phase as quickly as possible in a time efficient manner and do it in a way that still makes the candidates feel good, you know, they got to show up, they got to audition for a group interview, then you're getting into the meat of what it's going to take to hire, which is you still need to sit down with somebody and go through what is their history, what questions do they have about the agency and all these other things that I'll, I'll talk about today. But your goal is to get in that conversation sooner and get in a lot more of those conversations sooner, right? If, if I could get your sales team to spend more time quoting and less time cold calling, you'd probably agree that you'd sell more business. So if we can get you or you can get yourself involved in more second interviews and less cold outreach to candidates, the more hiring you're going to be doing. And the more people you talk to, the higher quality you're probably going to find, right? Like if you go out and you're doing it in a fashion that's going to bring you five people to talk to this month. And I do it in a way where I talk to 50 people. And we say, which one of these two people, agents, is going to get more quality? You could almost bet that the person that talks to 50 candidates in a month will find a higher quality person than the one that talks to five. Not to mention the vantage point's different, right? In group interviews, you're going to be able to look at people through a different lens. Um, usually when I would sit down with people one-on-one, -on -one, in interviews, and that was my first you know, phone, phone screening, Zoom, something like that, I'd be basically already forgetting about the last five people I met with. And I'd be so focused on that one person that they could really impress me. And they could really maybe help me put, out of my, put me out of my misery, right? Like I'm, I'm tired, this person actually looks different than the rest, and I think I'm gonna move forward with them. But what if that person were sitting in a room with six other people, or I had talked to 18 people in a week and they were one of them? right? My, my perspective might change. It's like, you might think you're looking at a division one player, but put them in a room where there's other division one players. And all of a sudden you say, no, they're actually, they're not, they're a D2 player. They're a D3 player. 
Um, I would have thought one-on-one -on -one that they were amazing because they'd look so much greater than everyone else. But again, when you stack people up side by side, it's a little bit different, right? And we like to, I don't know if we, Ashley, but I, I like to joke that when you do group interviews, it's like, an, it's like a singing audition, like an American Idol audition, and it's the first round. And when you put one singer in a room, you might be impressed by them, but put them in a room where they've got to sing against the talent of four or five, six other people, and suddenly their voice is going to sound different in comparison to the rest. So group interviews is something that I've seen as being extremely useful. Um, I'm working with an outfit right now in the insurance space out of Florida, and they came to us for some support, but they, they do, they'll do $350 million this year in premium. Um, they're, they're a national, national firm, and they've always used group interviews um, because it allows them to not only vet people faster, but it also allows them to create energy that there's other people that showed up for this job, right? People show up for a group and they see it's, oh, wow, I'm not the only one. Uh, other people want this position and, and that's going to raise your worth and it's going to allow you to speak to a room and pitch them on what it is that makes you different as well. Um, and so there's a lot of advantages to that. But what I want to dig into now is what happens beyond the phone screening or the group interview or whatever method that you're, you're using. And one of the things that I want to point out is, you know, how do you actually go in and source people to create the volume you need? Because whether you're going to utilize group interviews, right, whether you're going to utilize Team Hired or not, or, or do it on your own, either way, you're going to need people in your pipeline. And I think a lot of people right now are struggling to find candidates to talk to at all. And I want to talk to you about what it takes to get that done. So first and foremost, you know, if you're not driving referral candidates through your, your client base, through your existing team, which is a very common method, if you don't have people just walking into your front door asking for a job right now, you know, a lot of what people utilize is job boards, which really is just a, it's a, a space to market your position, obviously. But the thing that I don't think is done by most agencies is they won't sit down and treat that job board and that marketing campaign with the level of uh, intention and attention that they might give their sales campaigns. Like working with businesses now that I know will spend five or 10 or 20 grand a month on marketing on Google or on Facebook, if you've ever been involved in a marketing campaign like that, you'll know that people that spend good money on marketing campaigns pay very, very close attention to what's happening. They do A, B testing, right? They'll test a couple different ads or maybe 10 ads and they'll see which one's working the best. And they'll go through and they'll look at the click-through rates and they'll track conversions and they get very, very granular about what campaign is working because nobody wants to go spend their hard-earned marketing dollars into some sort of a campaign online that isn't converting. And what I've seen, and I've also been guilty of this, is the average sort of agency mentality about job boards is I'll go, you know, come up with a really awesome job description and it's going to say all of these amazing things. And I'm going to post it and I'm going to show up and I'm going to farm or go look for leads that pop in there every day. And that's who I'll reach out to for my position. But we're in a major disparity right now, right? It's 2023. Unemployment's extremely low and people still need to hire. And so what you see is you've got a lot of companies spending a lot of money and there's always going to be a company that spends more money than you right out there. And then you've got a smaller pool of talent. So there's this disparity, more jobs than there are people, right? More jobs than there is talent. And when you have a situation like that, you've got so many new ads flowing through that even if you have the perfect job ad, it's going to get suppressed pretty quickly. And so one of the things that, you know, we figured out and we can certainly help with this, but I'm here to give you value today, right? And I think one of the things we figured out is you have to go run those, I call them marketing campaigns for candidates, okay? That's what they are. You are marketing to people, your position, no different than marketing a policy. You need to go out and do it with a lot of intention. And, and some of that involves, you know, maybe testing several ads against each other, like literally going in and creating five job ads, try different keywords, try different descriptions, try different calls to action, right? Have a couple of variables that you test against each other and run them for 72 hours and then come back to it and download the data and look at it and say, wow, this one ad was identical except for we changed the title of it. And this one got 20 more applicants than the other one. Or wow, this one, we had somebody go to a landing page, but this one we had them apply through and we called them and it converted an extra 20%.
And you can start to figure out for you what's working best, or you can hire somebody to do that for you. But either way, just posting one ad um, is, is not going to, you know, it's not going to fare well. Um, and, and you'll end up spending a lot more money because people will maybe spend $50 a day on job ads. They'll post a job ad. It'll underperform, right? Candidates will start to drop off. They won't get as many applications. So what do they think? Well, let me go dump more money into it, right? I know this is what I used to think. So, oh, maybe I need to increase my budget. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. That, that ad is still competing against all of the others. So instead going out and sort of using an octopus approach, right? Let me go out there and let me create five or eight or 10 or 15 ads and test them against each other and put more money into the ones that are working and pull money out of the ones that aren't is a much better strategy. Um, you should be able to kill an ad instantly if you see that it's not performing. Um, and then refreshing those ads. Uh, another thing, you know, is being able to go in and spend the, invest the time to refresh and go back in and create new ads. Why? Because as ads age, they're going to show up lower in results. Even if you're sponsoring, the person that's been posted two days ago versus 60 days ago will look different to a candidate. If I'm applying to jobs and I see that your job's been posted for 69 days and I look at somebody else's and it's been posted for three, I'm thinking I'm going to apply to the one with three days because it's fresh and I have a better shot because there's probably less applicants. And it looks like this one that's been sitting there for 70 days, they're either indecisive or something, but it just doesn't make sense to me. So, I mean, the more astute candidates are going to look for things like that. So you really need to be refreshing ads as well. And then something you can actually experiment with is create your own landing page that is a hiring page that you can drive applicants to. You can post it on your social media. You can email it out. You can have your friends share it. And it's got a visual. You know, maybe just bear with me on this. Maybe record a video walking around your office interviewing your team about what they love about their job. Or just sit down on a Zoom, put a background behind you and do a 60 second introduction to why you're amazing. Why would it be amazing for somebody to get an opportunity with you? And throw that up on a landing page and list the benefits, right? And you can go to instapage.com, you can use Wix, you can use Webflow, you can literally just go Google single landing page creator. There are so many solutions and I'd be happy to help guide you to some of those tools, but you could create a landing page in an afternoon and create a link for it. And now you can drive your applicants there to look at that and consume something about you and get them more bought in. Or you can put it out there on your Facebook, on your LinkedIn. You know, and I'll, I want to touch on something on social media while we're on the topic, because I see a lot of agencies put out, we're hiring as a post. Drop in chat if you've ever done that. We're hiring, right? And I'll, let me, let me uh, just put in the chat box where we're at here. There's the chat box. So if you guys, have you ever put out a social media post saying we're hiring and it's got your benefits listed out and it's got an email and a phone number to call? The only problem I see with that is that most people aren't asking for others to share that. And there's so much power in sharing on social media, especially if you're doing it on like Facebook. Because if you're only putting it out to your network, right? Gregory, Frank, Eden, or in, if I go to your Facebook, right? And I see that you post something like that. Well, who is your audience? Your audience is your friends. And your friends are probably mostly what? Friends and family who already know you're hiring, who already would refer you somebody great. They're agency owners, right? And, and it's colleagues in the industry. So you're putting that post out to get a candidate, right? But how many candidates are you actually connected with that would see that and do something about it? I mean, I'm not going to apply to your job. An agency owner is not going to apply to your job. Your mom's not going to apply to your job. And so really think about audience here. If you can personally direct message other agency owners, maybe you know somebody in your community, right? They're, they're on the PTO board. They're uh, whatever it is. They're your local realtor and say, hey, uh, I'm putting out this post about hiring and we're hiring for our agency. Would you mind sharing it out to any group you're part of or to your page? You know, now they post it out and they've got 700 friends and 10 of them are looking for a job right now. And now they see that post and now they reach out to you. So if you're not doing the work to get people to share it out, you're cutting yourself off at the knees because you're just not getting exposure to a new audience. The audience you have has already seen that more than likely. So don't go for the number of likes you get on a post. Go for how many people are actually going to convert from it. And that, that starts with your audience. Um, the next thing I want to talk about here is going to be 
once you go out and you actually source candidates and, and you walk them through that initial process, you know, what, what do you do for second interviews? And I don't think really we need to spend a lot of time on how do I sit down and, and run through an interview? Uh, we can give you questions. If you email me, Andy at teamhired.com, I'll email you over some interview questions, right? That, that's one piece of this. But there's some things that I've seen agencies do over the years that have been really impressive. Um, one of them is an audition style uh, job shadow. And what I've seen agencies do is actually bring more than one candidate into their office at a time. So they'll bring two or three or four people in and they'll put them all on an, a cold list. And they'll say, hey, this position involves phone calls, a lot of phone calls potentially. It involves some rejection. And we all lift each other up here, but this is part, a big part of the job. You can't not talk to people and be successful here. So I've got a list. And what I want you to do is follow this script and call out to it. And all you're asking for is if they'd be interested in connecting with one of our specialists to talk about some rates we have or whatever it is. And you let them know, obviously, from a liability standpoint, that if they get somebody who goes, yeah, I'd be interested, they, they stop talking, they raise their hand, somebody jumps on the phone for them right? You're, you're setting up this scenario where they're not going to be touching anything to do with insurance, but they are getting an opportunity to jump into the water right there in front of you. And it can really help to bring more than one person in because now it's competitive. Now I see that, oh, wow, there's two other people sitting next to me. They're doing the same thing. And we're all trying to impress the owner. And I saw a, a long time, 30 plus year agent in uh, South Texas do this in Corpus Christi and her and her team and her daughter, you know, do job shadows. And the results they've gotten from it, from what I've heard, have been great because they get to see whether somebody clams up and they freak out that they got to make a cold call or, or whether they, they come in and they at least give it a shot. Um, ben said chat, chat is disabled, so let me, um, let me get that enabled for you all. Sorry about that. Okay. Ben, thank you. The double B helping me out with the chat. So sorry, guys. I'm like, nobody wants to chat today. Meanwhile, the chat shut down. Shame on me. Um, so this job shadow can be really useful and it can really show you a lot about somebody. And if somebody's like, I don't, I don't want to do this. I, I can't do this. I can't do this. What are you going to get week one, week two, when you say, go through this training, jump on these phones, call these referrals, give this a shot, give that a shot. You know, in this industry and in this market, you want somebody who has that fight in them. They might not always have the answers, but we always try to assess people through questions, right? Like, tell me what you can do. How about you show me what you can do? Here, I'm putting you into a situation. Boom, go. And they don't have to be perfect. They can be rough around the edges. But I've been in companies that do this group style audition and you'll see people get really into it and they're just, they're all in, they're standing up and they're on the phone and they're, they're trying to get an appointment within an hour for you. And you've got others who are just kind of hiding and they're in the corner and, you know, maybe they just... I don't know. They're not feeling it that day. Maybe they don't have the personality. You just, you can't really see that until you put somebody into the situation and you don't need to wait until they've started with you to find that out. Um, real quick, Ben, uh, for remote hiring, how about doing that audition style method, but putting them into a shared zoom room? Yeah, you, you could do that with the proper amount of planning, Ben. I never, I never thought about that. That's a great idea. But what Ben's talking about is create a scenario like this for a remote position where you invite several remote candidates into one room and do it on a shared Zoom uh, at the same time. And you know the way I might do that, Ben, is through breakout rooms and put each person into a breakout room. That way it could be recorded and documented and you can kind of float room to room. But if anybody likes that idea, um, I, that could definitely be planned. I'd be happy to help with that, Ben. That's, a, that's an awesome idea. And I think as long as you have the proper logistics set up behind it, um, that would be a great way to be able to tell a little bit more about a remote candidate, then you're going to get just through interview questions. So no, I really, really like that. Um, another piece of this is going to be assessments. And I can't, I can't show up and not talk about assessments, but when we talk about assessments, I want to make one big point. You don't, in our opinion, want to put an assessment before the first interview. Why? It all has to do with time. Okay. Try to keep things really simple here at Team Hired. So if I apply to your job and the first thing I'm asked to do is complete a 30 minute assessment, well, I might not know anything about your company yet. I haven't met you yet. I haven't heard anything that said, this is the job for me. So yes, there's going to be people that are willing to go through that. 
right? But the more competitive candidates, the ones that are out applying to five, 10, 15 different jobs, that could very much stop them up to not even apply at all. And I've heard from agencies before, well, if somebody's not vested enough to actually complete an assessment up front, you know, why should I meet with them? It's like, well, my position would be if I don't know anything about your company and you're asking for 30 minutes of my time without me knowing you, why should I complete the assessment? Right. And that's just, that's coming from, from somebody who's applied to several jobs in my career, but also just seen a lot of how this goes down is that you'll go out and you could have met with 30 people, but because you asked for them to spend 30 minutes on a, on a investing into a potential job they know nothing about, you might end up talking to five. And my, my question would be, was it worth losing the other 25 that weren't willing to complete that assessment? So when is the proper time to use an assessment? And it would really depend on, I think, why you're using the assessment. And I'm going to caution against one method versus the other. There's one school of thought which says, I want them to complete the assessment just to see if they're vested enough or invested enough to complete one. And from that standpoint, you know, I could see where in a less competitive job environment, you might use it just as a, as a vetting tool to see who's interested enough to complete something I asked them to complete. But I think for most agencies using it how they're intended, which is I really want to know something more about this candidate, it can be put right in front of them, right at the office. You can either have them complete it as they're coming in, before they show up, or what we recommend is you just sit them down at a workstation at the end of their interview if it went well, and you have them complete it. And you don't say, this is an assessment to assess your qualities, blah, blah, blah. You say, this is an assessment to figure out where you'd best fit in the environment here, right? There's no, there's no pass or fail. Now on your end, you might have a hard cut rule that says, I'm going to not hire somebody who doesn't meet these requirements in the assessment. But the way that this candidate needs to feel about it is this is just a deep dive on me. And so you can do that right at the office, have them complete it, get the assessment. And now when you're going through trying to make a decision on whether to offer it or not, you know, you've got that information on hand and you didn't cost yourself not being able to talk to that person because you asked them up front to complete it, but they showed up, they met with you and their interest raised, right? Whether it was a first or second interview, they said, wow, I really want this job. They went home and talked to their spouse about it. I really want this job. And now when you ask them to complete an assessment, like, yeah, you know, the right person's going to say, yeah, I'll, I'll complete that because they know that that's a requirement now for you. So I think just placement is very, very important. And the most common assessments we hear of are ideal traits. Uh, can they sell? Uh, Myers-Briggs is still being used a lot. I love that assessment. Um, DISC profiling as well. And then what you can do is you can have your existing team take the assessment and then just benchmark the candidate's assessment against your top performers. Um, instead of just using their key, use your own success as the key. Um, and then what I heard about last week from an agent on Friday, uh, he's been in the industry for 50 years, 75 years old, okay? Um, he, he uses Wonderlick, uh, which is like a cognitive assessment. And you know, I, I took it for him, um, scored like a 33. It was, it was more of a, 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 an assessment on their ability to process information. Very, very interesting. Cause it wasn't necessarily a personality test. It was more of a cognitive assessment. So I thought that that could be valuable to bring to this call um, as well. Uh, so kind of transitioning out of this topic of, okay, I go out and I source people and I take them through either group interviews or phone screenings. I, I get them in the office. I take them through an interview. Maybe I do a job shadow. Maybe I do an assessment. You know, beyond that, I would say for the right person, take them to lunch. Um, I, I work for a very long-standing company in New York, and they took me and every other candidate to lunch before they would hire them. And they'd bring their key person, whether it was their top performer, their manager at the time, their COO, and they would just go out and have a lunch. And it was to get somebody out of that normal environment, that normal office environment, and see how they are in a social setting. Sometimes that'll tell you way more than a formal interview. Once somebody gets to talking, they can either, you know, shoot themselves in the foot because they start saying some inappropriate things. They start saying things that, you know, just aren't really agreeable with their mindset on life. Or, you know, they really make great conversation. You get along with them to a point where you're like, I would love this person to be in front of any one of my clients. I would love to take this person and put them in front of a table at a fair and have them talk about our, our, our policies. and it's just a different environment. And you're going to, you know, try to keep those lunch interviews off of interview style questions and just have a conversation. Hey, so tell me, you know, you were saying you were from Kansas. Um, how'd you end up here? You know, and you just, you want to open up regular conversation. 
um, and network. Network with the person you're going to hire before you hire them. Um, could be a great method that you could use. So the last thing I'm going to mention on in-office interviews is try to introduce this candidate or these candidates to your existing team. And I'm going to hear the reason a hundred times, well, Andy, my team is busy. I'm not going to pull them off the phones. You know, I'm not talking about an hour long interview. I'm talking about you grab your number one performer and you say, Hey, we got a candidate coming in today. I would love if you could go in the back room and just have a conversation with them. I'm not even going to be there for it. Right. Uh, I, I want you to just tell them a little bit about your experience. You can ask them questions if you want. Let me know what you think afterwards. So this is knocking out two birds with one stone. Number one, this person's getting a chance to see behind the veil and actually see that spark in somebody's eye that's like, yeah, look, I, I, I started with Jason six years ago and the uh, best decision I ever made, you know, I was cleaning homes and he brought me in as a uh, manager up front on the phones and then promoted to LSP. And, you know, last year uh, was one of our best years ever. Uh, it's a great culture. We're like a family here. Jason's the best. Jazz is the best. Candace is the best. They're going to be able to hear that from your producer. And if you're like, I don't, I'm afraid of what they'll say. Don't just sweep that under the rug either. I've heard that before. I don't want to put them in a room with my producer. I don't know what they're going to say. Okay, that needs to be addressed right away. If you really feel that way, like there's something that your team would say about you that was negative behind the scenes, you need to work on that because that is your culture, right? And that is the assessment of how you feel about your team and how they feel about their position. So that could be a great learning experience as well. If, if you thought that, don't drop it in the chat, but if you thought that, oh, wow, I don't know if I'd want to put a candidate in a room alone with, with one of my producers right now. Why is that? That's a really good question for you to ask. What can you do to resolve that issue? Um, but, but also, it's going to make your existing producer feel good, right? Like, I felt really good when I had a director say, hey, Andy, I really value your opinion. We got a candidate coming in. Can I put you in a room with him for five minutes? You can ask him any question you want. Um, and, and then they can ask you any question they want about your experience with us. And then let me know what you think afterwards. And I felt so good. I'm like, I made it. Been here two years. I'm already being asked to go back and, and help interview and make a decision. And it made me more vested in the person if they chose to hire them, right? And it's really, really important to get some of that feedback as well. So I would never let a producer make the decision for me, right? You are not held hostage to anybody on your team. If you have the right culture, you are the leader you respect the opinions. And unless somebody throws up a huge red flag that they're going to rub the whole team the wrong way, you use it as part of your decision. You don't make your sole decision based on that. I, I've seen agencies get held up and they're looking for the one person that everyone's going to love. But the other side is producers can be threatened by others. Oh, I don't know. They seem pretty tight to me, seem pretty good. And human nature, right? They might not be uh, even aware of it, but that assessment back from your team is, is one piece of data. It should not be the entire decision, but it's something you can add into your hiring process, which should be able to help you know, add another layer into that decision. So I keep looking over here because I've got some notes uh, just to keep us on track for time here. But the next thing I want to talk about is going to be once you've gotten through and you found that person that you want to hire, you know, what about setting expectations? Um, I would not wait to set expectations till after they've been hired. I would set those expectations up, not only on the compensation plan, but I would set them up early on in the process as you're having conversations. And a lot of people will say, well, what expectations do I set? Or have a, you know, have a, a, a question about where should I actually place value? What should I be talking about with these candidates when it comes to what I expect? And first of all, I would say that's up to you. But I do want to give some guidance on it. And there's this sort of trifecta of what makes somebody successful in an agency or any, any position, right? And I like to break it down like this. It's activity, attitude, and approach. If you can get all three of those things in line, somebody's putting out the right level of activity, they're doing it with the right attitude, and they're taking the right strategic approach, then usually if those three things align, they're going to be performing at an at a above average level within your agency. So I like to set up expectations around those three bullet points right? When we think about activity, that's mainly going to roll into how many calls do they make? How many emails do they send? How many referrals do they bring? So you want to set up some metrics for that early on. Hey, I expect everybody on my team to make at least 100 phone calls a day. Okay, that's a requirement. And the only time you can get out of that requirement is if you don't work here. Or the only time you can get out of that requirement is if you're writing above $30,000 a month in premium, right? I'm not going to require that. So 
you you can take that approach that you know maybe there's an exception given a certain level of performance but i think we could all agree that activity truly breeds the opportunity within the agency activity is the root of the success and if you really expect to be successful in my agency you got to know that activity drives everything that we do here so the more people that you talk to the more opportunities you're going to have to quote get referrals and it's going to be exponential growth right the longer you're here putting in that work the more relationships you'll build it'll just exponentially stack up a pipeline and the next level down is going to be attitude and I have a lot of agencies say, well, how do I hold somebody to an attitude expectation? If they have a bad attitude, I fire them. If, if they show up and they just bring problems to the agency and not solutions, I just let them go. And what I would say is one great way to drive attitude is create a scenario where you have people write down their targets and or their goals, either for in the office and or outside the office. And I learned this working for an international sales trainer down in Miami, Grant Cardone. I was with him for like three years. And they actually required us to write down our goals every day, every day, every day. And that was something that was measured. And the attitude was, I don't want you practicing on my customers. And if you come in here and you don't know why you're here, what are we doing? How are you expected to show up with that positive attitude if you don't know why you're here? It kind of stemmed from the you know, person being goal oriented or not. So it'd be interesting in your interview process to actually ask for somebody to write down their goals and provide them to you, right? That would be interesting. See what this person would write down for themselves as some life goals. But beyond that, actually having your team complete it. Um, if you want me to go through with your team on a call and talk to them about setting goals and some structures they can use and some different ways you can do this, I'd be more than happy to do that. Just, just reach out to me afterwards. Um, the, the next level down beyond that would be approach. Okay, so we got activity, we got attitude, we got approach. And I would say for setting expectations, I would have a daily training expectation. When you think about strategy, somebody's approach, how successful they'll be. I've seen, I saw a kid make 250 phone calls a day for six months. And, and they would have got rid of them after three, except for the activity level was so great. Those were manual dials all day, all day like this. No bathroom breaks, no lunch breaks. But he wasn't selling any business. He had a great attitude, great activity level, poor approach. And so eventually he sort of washed out and went on to, to something else that, that worked out for him. But at the end of the day, that approach piece is something that is very much within your control and you can very much set an expectation around it. How does somebody get better? Do they get better because of a decision? No, they get better because they make a decision to get better and then they train. And then they, they take in material, they practice, they role play, they rehearse. So what I've seen in the most successful offices is they'll role play every single day. Like Dave's team used to break at 1 p.m. and they do a rotation. Everybody would role play with one another. Um, I would say role playing in the morning is great. Allow people to blow off steam and knock off the rust and get loosened up for the day on each other. And you can go in and do something really simple. Put people in pairs. And if you have an odd number, then pair up with them yourself. And take 15 minutes. Doesn't have to take all day, but say, I don't want my team practicing on my customers. So whenever we come in here, we're going to loosen up. I'm going to have my team sit face to face and they're going to throw each other their number one objection that they've been getting. And they're going to have to role play that objection over and over and over again every day. Or you've got some kind of training, like there's, there's a bunch out there, right? Bunch of different trainings. You go in and you require a certain number of content or, or videos per day, but you don't just have people watch videos. You have people watch a video or two and you have them get together for 10 minutes and talk about it, right? A lot of learning is about discussing it and, and rehearsing what we talked about and practicing it. So instead of just doing video training, you have people actually practice it. And that's something you can measure. Hey, I require everybody on my team to watch two videos a day, or I require everybody on my team to show up at you know, nine o'clock sharp and we start role play at 9.03 and we're out of role play by 9.20 unless we have a hot sales call coming in or a claim. And you can put that into the comp plan. So they, they feel like showing up late. They feel like, you know, not participating in training. You're like, what's this person doing? You know, I set the expectation early on that this wasn't just about hitting the activity level. It's not just about the attitude. It's about getting better every day. And if they're costing deals because they didn't know how to handle an objection or they didn't follow up to the right level or they don't know how to prospect, right? They should be working on that every single day. But I think as a leader, if you don't put, an expectation in place to, to hold them accountable to that, you know, you're not going to create an environment where that happens every day. So 
Um, expectations on training every day is another thing that you can set very early on. And you could even write it into a compensation plan or an expectations sheet. Um, and then last would be minimum production, right? Like what is, what is the minimum target that I want to see here hit every single month? And for a lot of agencies, we recommend a, a 60 or 90 day trial period after hire that you can have a certain benchmark that this producer needs to get to before you decide if they're going to be with you long term. And that's a, a really fair thing to have in place. Um, in some states, it's just standard and others, you actually have to write it into your plan. But having minimum performance metrics that, hey, bare none, no matter what, I need you to hit this performance metric, X amount of premium per month, X number of policies per month, X number of life apps per month. And that's what you're here for, right? At the end of the day. Um, and so activity, attitude, approach, and performance are four things that you can bake into your expectations by having a call expectation, by having goals that are being required to, to be sent in, or even just targets, right? If people don't want to get into goals, get into have people having personal targets for themselves and making that a requirement that they write down and they show it to you. And the way the office I was in used to do it is they'd have somebody walk around at the end of the day, last 10 minutes of the day, hey, can I see your target sheet, right? And they sign off on it. Because if I saw a producer not submit that sheet for three days in a row, I'd be like, whoa, they might be losing focus. Either they don't believe in staying on track with their targets or B, something's going on with them. And I don't need to hammer them for it. What I need to do is figure out how I can help. Like, why, why, why aren't we going in target oriented? What's happening? And, and that's going to help you pinpoint problems earlier. So a lot of these expectations are going to be tools after the hire to help get them back on track before it gets out of control. Um, and that's, that's why I'm recommending them. So um, when you see somebody miss an expectation, I would take a, an approach of, I call it the, the three Ds. Number one, drill down. What is the problem and can you help? Maybe somebody's having something personal go on. Maybe they got a real conflict with the technology you're using and they don't understand it. And there needs to be something done to help them. Okay, so first you try to help. You don't just fire somebody. You go in and you drill down to the problem. If that doesn't work and you drill down to a problem and they still didn't correct it, then you want to document, right? Drill down, then document. And then the third time it happens, you want to make a decision, right? Is this, do I need to change my expectations at this point for a good reason, really good reason, or do I need to go ahead and let this person move on? Um, and, and so drill down, document, and decide when something doesn't go right or somebody's not hitting your expectations. Um, at this point, what we could do is we can organize a lot of this into a, a compensation plan. So just looking at kind of the, the standard layout that we'd have, this is not the end all be all, but this is going to give you a, a, a really good uh, idea of what a compensation plan might look like over here at Team Hired. So I'll send this out because I know it's a little bit small, but what you're going to see is our plans are on a single sheet of paper and they've got a base pay, they've got hours of operation, they've got a commission table, and they've got pay examples underneath that. So this is actually you know, doing the math for the candidate. If you sold X amount of premium 12 months of the year, I've already done the math to add up your base pay, how much that tier would pay out over 12 months, and how much you would expect to make on a tax return by the end of the year. So when you're advertising a job for, let's say, 40 to 80,000 a year, 40 to 100,000, you should be able to show that on a sheet of paper. How can I achieve that number? And so when it comes to compensation plans, you know, that's something that we can help you with. Um, it's absolutely something that we'd be happy to dive through and either take your existing plan and kind of put it into that format. Maybe you kind of want to start from scratch. But again, keeping it on a single sheet of paper and having numbers and having a table that shows you sell this amount, I'll pay you this percentage, that'll pay you this monthly commission. You sell that amount every month for 12 months, you'll make this much in a year. Builds a lot of confidence. It'll match up with the job ads that you've run and the expectations that you've set. And we like to say like salespeople want to keep it simple, right? Uh, they really want to be able to go in and just say, how much money can I make here? Right? That's, that's at least how I'm wired. I know a lot of you probably are. I saw the job said I could make 80,000 a year. How do I do that? Right? Nobody applied to make the 40. Really? Like nobody did that. Hopefully not, right? They came in because they wanted to make the big juicy number that you advertised. So you need to show them how to get there and you need to show them that it's possible. And so I've had agencies recently be including examples. They'll take off the name, but they'll say, let me show you one of my team members. Here's how much they made in their first 12 months. Here's how they did it, right? Here's an actual example to build confidence in that number. Um, beyond that, there's a lot of new things I've been seeing. So I think keeping it simple, keeping it on a single page, 
you know, ha having to be a competitive base pay for your market, uh, which probably these days for entry level is going to be between thirty-five to forty thousand dollars base plus commission. And when you get into hiring licensed people, you're definitely going to get into the forty forty thousand plus range on base pay. But beyond having you know that that proper base pay and the clear examples, I, I would say think about some creative incentives. Um, I recently saw an agency that tiers it in a way that they basically say if you hit X amount of premium. X number of quotes and calls, and X number of referrals in a given month, you're going to achieve a certain tier. And they have three different levels, sort of like all states, you know, three different levels that they have. But what they'll do that's different with it is they'll say, if you're in tier one, meaning maybe you wrote, you know, X amount of premium, it wasn't quite the highest tier, you made under the amount of phone calls to make it into two, tier two or three, you had a number of quotes that put you into that tier A, that at that tier, you get this type of lead and you get you know, th this type of technology to use, whatever it might be. But then if you hit the next tier, I turn on an even hotter, more expensive lead that I purchase. And I'm gonna give that to you because you're performing at a level that tells me I can entrust you with those leads that I spend a boatload of money on. Or you make it to the third tier, you get the leads, you get this technology, you get what I saw is a 35 hour work week. And I think on the sheet, the person's gotta be writing like $50,000 a month plus in premium. They got to have an average of a certain number of quotes per month. And I've got a breakdown. I can send anyone on this call. And Eden, yeah, I will email the example. Absolutely, I'll email the example out to you. Um, and I'll send you both examples. Uh, but I I've seen an agent using it now to where if somebody hits that third tier, wow, they hit all their targets. They hit their quotes, their policies, their premium, everything. And they achieve that highest level, they get a 35-hour work week. And as long as they keep that production level up, agency owners like, I don't care. And if anybody else has a problem with it, I'm going to let them know it's a fair playing field. You want a 35 hour work week, you have an equal opportunity to anybody else here to hit that number. So another thing I've seen is like end of the year trips. Hey, if you hit the, the third tier, at least six months out of the year, you're going to be eligible to get a cruise for you and your, your family or whatever it is. So there's some really creative things that you can do, creative incentives, but I'd also say contests, you know, running contests regularly. And creating contests where maybe in one week you say, hey, it's end of the month. Anybody who cracks 45K in premium this month, I'm going to send you a 70-inch flat screen TV. Anybody who breaks $50,000 this month, extra $500 on your check. Anybody who makes at least 200 phone calls or quotes at least 10 people today, a day off paid the first day of the month, next month. You can just, you could do things like this all the time. And it keeps people excited. It's something different. You know, and it gets them off of this long-term goal and it gets them hyper-focused on today. Um, you can do team contests. Hey, as a team, if we hit this number today, we do this, this level of production, we hit this variable comp number, you know, I'm going to bonus you all X amount or you all get to go out to dinner with, with your family paid on me, whatever it is. Or we're going to do a team outing, right? We're going to go, we're going to go skydiving. I don't know, but you can be really creative and just come up with contests all the time do them every day, do them every week. Um, it's something I've seen Dave do a lot of within his organizations um, that's very, very effective. Um, you could also do like a team bingo, right? Ashley Buster knows all about this, um, creating like a bingo game where certain metrics and performance levels win different spots on the bingo board. And if you hit bingo, you know, you get something for that. Um, you can create these games and, and gamify the day-to-day -day within your agency. So when it comes to compensation, just to break it down one more time, keep it simple. Hey, keep it simple. Yeah, Ashley said, yes, so fun and motivating. It is, it is having things like that in place. Um, keep your compensation plan simple. Try to keep it on a single sheet. Okay, we don't need to write paragraphs and paragraphs of information. Have clear pay examples and clear commission examples. Um, have your benefits on there. Okay, even if you need a separate sheet to break down the details, at least have the, the baseline benefits broken down and get creative with contests and incentives and tiers and things like that. And there's a lot, to be talked about on compensation. In fact, we did a whole webinar just on compensation. And if you want to do a deep dive on it, I can send you that recording or we could dive through it on a phone call together um, to look at your plan. But I'll send out some examples after this. Um, now, you know, in our last 10 minutes or so, and, and admittedly, I might run over just a few minutes, but uh, we'll be recording if any of you need to drop off at the top of the hour. I understand, but I'll, I'll try my best to, to hit the finish line here on time for you all. Um, when it comes to onboarding, Kay, here's our recommendation is that if somebody needs to be licensed, get them licensed first. Somebody just agreed to come on board. We're not going to throw licensing at them at the same time that we're throwing 
you know, company training and compliance and CRM and lead flow and all these other things, one thing at a time. Because if you try to do all of that plus licensing, it's going to stretch their licensing out. Somebody really needs to devote a lot of focus and they've got to get in a flow state with this licensing, right? They have to be in a state of almost unconscious kind of, oh yeah, yeah, I've, I've read that practice quiz 500 times. Like when they're in the exam center, it needs to be just hammered into their brain. And, and they can't do that if they're constantly being interrupted to do 15 different things in the agency. So we would say, you know, ideally bring them in. You take the risk as the business owner, bring them in, okay? Pay them less than you might pay them with a license, but pay them something. Because the reality is 80 plus percent of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Most people you're going to be interviewing don't have some nest egg of money that they can just float their rent and their groceries and all these things without being extremely stressed out. And so stress management's important, right? But I, I mean, how can I tell somebody that, sorry, you know, you're going to go home and do this all on your own. There's no sign on bonus. There's no pay for training. I'm not going to pay you till you get binding authority. And then you're going to hit my payroll and they don't get a check for four weeks. You're going to lose eight out of 10 candidates doing it that way from just a financial perspective. So I'd say, ideally, you have them in the office, you get them integrated in your culture. You make them feel like they got the job, right? Because they did technically. Now, if they can't get licensed, maybe they don't have the job anymore. But I don't want somebody feeling like this is a 1099 position, right? Or a contractor position. You're coming to work for farmers. You're coming to work for Allstate. You're coming to work for State Farm, Geico, like billion dollar companies. Okay. You guys wear that logo. So represent that logo the way that people would envision it through the commercials they've seen and the logo and the community, which is, hey, we're going we're gonna to pay you to train. I'm going to give you the resources that you need. I'm going to give you the coaching that you need. Like if you do something like the team hired boot camp, and you're going to have a structured path that you walk through. And all I want you to do is focus on getting this license because as soon as that's done, I can get you into the company training. Then when you finally get that license knocked out, right now I would expect somebody to knock that out in two weeks. I give them two weeks to complete it. Now we get into binding authority, company training. And there's a couple of bullet points I really want to hit on here. Number one, you need to get somebody to perform with high activity levels early on. And you should have already set that expectation. But you see somebody can't come in and make 35 phone calls, they're in the wrong type of work in their first month. You should come in and give them something extremely simple. Hey, here's a stack of age leads. These are all people that were interested or they're winbacks or whatever it is. And here's the script that we're going to train on. And I want you to target 100 plus phone calls a day. If you're using an auto dialer, 200 plus calls a day, whatever it is. And right now, you're going to learn. You're going to take some hard knocks. Okay, it's okay. It's okay if you get hung up on. It's okay if somebody rejects you. It's okay. That's how we learn. And I want you to go through and you're going to target, you know, a connection every maybe five to 10 calls. When you make a connection, you're going to go for that quote. And if you're uncomfortable in the quote, you're going to pull in one of our other team members. We're going to help you and we'll even pay you on the deal. But your first goal here is you want to become your own machine gun, your own farmer here. Instead of always just being fed, you know, one lead after another, if you can learn this in the business, you'll be successful with everything else. And you really need to explain that to them, right? If you can do this part well, everything else will be easy. It'll be gravy. So you don't want somebody coming in and making 30 phone calls a day, being pulled in nine different directions. You want them coming in, building that muscle so that after 30 days, everyone in the office is like, wow, I'm being shown up by the rookie. I'm the vet. And yeah, I sold a little bit more than them this month because I've been here and I got a referral network, but I made 12 phone calls today and this kid made 125. It'll help your team wake up. It'll help your team wake up. I was that guy. I was that veteran. And when people came in and made 200 calls a day and I was making 20, like, man, man, what am I doing? When did I lose that? When did I lose that muscle? And so you want to you wanna do that for your team too, is set an early expectation of high activity. Um, the other thing is listen to the calls early on, right? Listen to them and don't, you know, don't hammer somebody ho so hard that they end up going home crying because they think they're horrible. But pull a call every couple of days. Say, hey, come on over. Hey, awesome. You're doing great. Hey, let's sit down. And I listened to a couple of calls. One of them, awesome. That call with Jerry went great. I listened to one now that I thought you did really well on. There were a couple of things that I think if you just tweak, man, you're, you're this close to just breaking out here. So I just want to go through it with you. And you just, you play 10 seconds and you pause it. Hey, did you hear that at the beginning? You're like, no, what? Did you hear how they asked you how you were doing too? And you didn't answer and you just went right into the pitch. Oh yeah, I heard that. Okay, cool. There, if we ask a customer how they're doing and they return the favor and ask us how we're doing, we just want to be personal. 
I'm doing well. Thank you so much for asking. The reason I called today. Okay, so you good with that? Okay, perfect. Make a note of that. Okay, bing, I'm going to keep playing the recording. A minute in, I pause it again. Okay, did you hear how they threw out a concern about time, but not pricing, and we jumped right into a price objection? Okay, can you see where, what would you have done differently on that call? And you just do this coaching. Take 15, 20 minutes out of your day, invest it into this person, and it's going to pay you back. Because essentially, I mean, you're, you're asking somebody to replace what you don't want to do, right? Or that you can't do yourself if you want to scale. So if you want to transfer that skill set, or you want to have a team member transfer their skill set, when does that transfer happen? It's got to happen at some point. And I think that call reviews are a great way to transfer those skills. And then imagine they do a call review, they come in the next morning and they role play, like we talked about earlier. Now you're double stacking and somebody's getting better so much faster than just figure it out. Or I only drop in to help them with one call one day and that's it. And that's all they got from me all month long. Ugh, yikes. They went to, they went to a NFL training camp and they got coaching time for five minutes and the rest of the time they had to figure it out. It's not going to create a successful team if, if you're doing that flyby sort of training. You got to have a process to this. Um, you also have to help them taste success early. And I would say as soon as you're comfortable investing some money into producing some, some opportunity for them, whether that be investing in an event to go get them some leads, whether that be providing them with leads, whatever it is. You know, do that early on, as soon as you're comfortable doing that, because what will happen if somebody doesn't make money is they'll leave, especially when it comes to sales positions. You really want somebody to taste that success early on. You want them to get a paycheck that they've never had before in their first 60 days and go, this is real. And if they don't have that, this is real moment early on, much higher chance that they're going to leave. Uh, you know, other than the culture, right? And other than the training and other than the career path that you develop for them, like the other thing that could really hurt is if they're not performing and they're doing all the work, but they're just running up against the brick wall. So you need to figure out what are the things that are cutting them down? What are the barriers that I need to help train for? Why would I expect somebody to write me 40 grand a month in premium if they're calling only age data? Probably not going to happen. So you need to start to look at that as well and just make sure they're winning early on. That That is... I think as much your responsibility as it is theirs, because again, you're transferring what you don't necessarily have the time to do yourself and you're expecting them to do it at a very high level. And if they can taste that early success, now they're like, I'm vested in this for me. I'm not just doing this so I sound good on the phone or I can make them a lot of money. Like I just made more money than I've ever made in a month. And now I'm even more pumped to come back next month and do it again. Um, now looking at you know team, team member accountability and looking at the things that's going to make somebody successful um, in that first 60 to 90 days, I think you got you to really gauge early on effort versus result. Because I've seen people take a little bit longer to perform, right? I've seen somebody take 90 days to kind of turn the ship around, but every day they did their training. Every day they wrote their goals down. Every day they put in the activity level. They asked questions. They were coachable. And I would much rather keep somebody on for an extra 30 days like that and see if they can crank it up then I would keep somebody on who just hit my bare minimum expectation on business, but they have a bad attitude. They're rubbing toxicity on other team members and they're making excuses for why they can't hit their activity levels. And they're showing up late and they're making excuses for it. And they're not doing training. I mean, what are you going to get with that person long-term is, is a flat line. Um, Shelly's got a question. If you're paying them to go through the boot camp, what if they don't pass the test the first time? Do you stop the payroll and give them a specific time frame they have to pass the test by? Yeah. So what I would do is I would do a, a waning pay scale on that. So I'd say, if you pass the exam in a week flat, I'll pay you $1,500. <laughs> if you pass it in two weeks, I'll pay you $1,250, which by the way, it's like, it's like 13, 13, 15 hours, something like that. Um, if, if it takes you four weeks to pass, okay. Um, I'm going to pay you $750. Because at some point, right, it's going to become, it can't just be about the money. It can't be, I'm doing this because I want to get the money, but, but you want to use that money as a driver and an incentive to show them that you care. And also with the waning incentive, it's like, Ooh, if I really get this done now and I take this seriously, I got a chance to make 1500. I got a chance to make 1200, but if I'm going to drag it out and maybe I'm going to get a second pass to do it again, but I'm going to, I'm going to cost myself $500 right out of the gate. It's very much in line with what you're trying to do with sales incentives, right? So I would say maybe a waning incentive schedule, or you do something that says, I'm going to pay you $12 an hour for the first two weeks, 
Um, works out to about $480 a week, about a thousand dollars at the end, a little bit more than that, or a little bit less than that. But if you pass this thing on the first go, I'm going to bonus you an extra $500, right? So you can do things like that and you're not always going to get it perfect. So you need a bench. Um, you need to have multiple people in that pipeline. And that leads me to one of my last points here, which is, you know, you really need to look at the stats right now and also understand that the success rate is only about one in three hires right now as an industry average. Now we work with clients that have a success rate of six out of 10 retained using 10 as a round number. I work with a client who I just spoke with today who retains a little over 80%. So eight out of every 10 they retain, uh, which is really good, right? When you consider the industry averages is, is between 30 and 40%, which I think if most look at their numbers, they'll see that's about right. And if you're doing better than that, then the goal is just to improve above your own number. But when I think about that, people drop out because of lack of performance because of personal problems, because they weren't able to meet certain expectations, because they weren't able to pass licensing, whatever it might be. And so if you can just plan ahead and say, you know, I really gotta be getting three people in my pipeline right now for every one that I want longer term, it'll, it'll change your mindset. And it's a lot of why we do things the way we do them at Team Hired in terms of like volume hiring, in terms of going out there and building a bench, which really means I always wanna have at least one or two people on deck. I want to be looking at resumes, having an interview. I want maybe, you know, maybe I want my receptionist to be studying for their exam if they have an interest in that and, and vetting them for a potential LSP position. Maybe I have 6,000 age leads in my system. And what I need to do right now is go out and hire somebody to work those leads for me as a telemarketer and then incentivize them that they can step up into an LSP position if things go well on the telemarketing position and that you'll invest in the license for them. So that now if somebody fails the licensing and, and, and they're your first candidate, you can go back to your bench. You can go back to the resumes you've been looking at. You can go back to the person you interviewed last week. You can go to the receptionist. You can go to the telemarketer and somebody can step up into that opportunity sooner rather than later. Or you have something like Team Hired going. We have an always be hiring plan and we're just bringing you people month after month and you always have a bench. Um, that That's how we would approach it, Shelly, is you know, you're not always going to get it perfect, but try to create it in a way that's fair to them and play on positive emotion. Use incentives and incentivize them that the sooner they get it done, the more money they're going to make. And hopefully for the right person, that's, that's going to drive them to do the right thing. Um, lastly here, what I want to do, you know, I, I was going to go through kind of a path to management, which I think just for the sake of time, I'll save for the next webinar. Um, but the last thing that I wanted to touch on here is just scaling beyond the mom and pop mentality. And there's no other way I could say this. First of all, none of you are in the mom and pop mentality um, because you've taken time out on the 30th of the month to learn about hiring and retention and, and onboarding. So you're doing exactly what it takes to get out of that, that situation, right? Is you're learning, you're taking on new information. But what I would say is you need to get around peers who push you, get around some agency owners and don't be afraid to reach out. I, I've been amazed at the number of relationships that have been built just by reaching out to other agency owners. Um, I had an agency owner on here a little bit earlier who I connected with via text to another agency owner, two different coasts, one's in California or Washington, one's in Tennessee. And they have an ongoing relationship now because she's like, you told me about this guy, I'd love to connect with them. I'm like, I'll connect you two. And being curious enough to be connected with a new agency owner, you're gonna get a friend, you're gonna get somebody who can share ideas with you and if you can get one or two or three or five agency owners in your circle, either through social media, via text message, via call Andy and say, who do I need to know in my market that I haven't met yet? Be willing to go out there and build those relationships with people because they're going to be the ones that show you what's working for them. You maybe were just going to try a certain marketing company and they went and they already did it and they found out it didn't work for them and they can share that with you and you can, you can save yourself the cost of that, that mistake that they made. Um, th there's other areas that you can immerse yourselves in. Uh, you can go to industry events, not just for the topic, but you can go to industry events to actually learn, you know, about who else is out there. Sit down at a table at lunch and introduce yourself around and figure out where are people, how long have they been in the industry, what's working for them. And I put out a post in a, a group the other day that it only takes one question to a stranger to change your trajectory of your business forever. And if that stranger, if you can get around people that have been where you are and they've been able to build $10 million agencies, $20 million agencies, $30 million agencies, 
and they're out there, guys. They're out there everywhere, right? There's not thousands of them, but there's hundreds. And, and if you can, you know, connect with one and get in their stream of thought, all of a sudden you're going to start to see a separation. The agencies that are speaking out of fear that are saying, oh, the rates, but the high performing agency is saying, we love the rates. We just got a pay raise. Oh, the leads are so tough. Oh, the high performing agency. Yeah, we cut them out. We built our own lead funnel and that's working extremely well for us. Oh, I can't hire anybody. Nobody's got enough talent. Oh, we looked at that. We built a training program. Here's how we train. And we do this every day and we do that. And that's how we create our next best top producer. You want your news stream, your news feed, your information coming in to be somebody who's got that, that fighting mentality. And it's what I appreciate about being around people like Dave and Tom is they've always had that mentality, even within team hired. You know, we face challenges that you guys face too. Something will be switched up on us and we have to perform for you on hiring and we got to pivot quick and we got to figure it out because there's more than just one agency on the line when it comes to that stuff. And so I've never, ever once heard a victim mentality. I've never heard, you know, oh, I guess we'll just ride it out. It's like, here's the problem. What can we do about it? And that's coming from a couple guys that had to weather the storm within a couple of very large agencies. And so that same mentality is, is carried over. And I'd say all of the large agencies have a plan. If you ask them what their plans are, they're not just talking about, well, you know, we're going to hire this one person or we're going to integrate this new lead, lead funnel. Their plan is based on numbers. They're saying, well, if we write X amount of premium per month, then that's going to add up to be this much ongoing business. And that's going to create a lifetime value, which helps us increase our book $2 million this year. And that is our target. And what we've done is we've reverse engineered that we're going to need X number of producers at our average sell rate to do that. And we knew looking at our leads that we wouldn't be able to get them to that level without investing in a new lead process. So we're doing three and we're testing them against each other. And you'll see a lot of this, you know, going on a lot of testing, a lot of, we need to achieve this target. So we're going to try two or three things and we're going to test them. And whichever is the winner, we're going to move forward with, and we'll kill the other two. It's never this all in. This is the one thing that's going to work. It's trying so many things and testing what's going to work and then being willing to give up on something too. Like not getting romantic about what worked for you a year ago, what worked for you a year ago may not work today in terms of generating new business, hiring people. Um, integrating your systems, your technology, your payroll, um, everything. So I think being willing to reevaluate consistently what's working and what's not working and getting really, really organized. And if you're like, I'm not the organized agency owner, Andy, cool. Somebody on your team's organized or there's a CPA you can partner up with that's organized or there's somebody else out there who can, who can help you learn, right? We're never too old to learn. And it could be as simple as having a couple of spreadsheets you don't have now, having a dashboard set up you don't have now, something to keep you in tune with the metrics of your team, something to keep you in tune with your, your business and how it's forecasting against your end of your goals. And if you don't have those things in place and you get to the end of the year and you're like, why didn't, why didn't I reach my goal? It's like, well, did we look at the goal every day? Did we have a plan? Did we measure if we were on track with the goal? And every time I've measured something, I've seen it go up consistently. And if it doesn't, I've been able to correct it. But anytime I kind of sweep it under the rug and I don't have a metric sitting in front of me is when the performance starts to dwindle and I start to kind of lose focus on it. And I can be pulled in a hundred different directions and forget that I'm in control of this ship, right? I am the one who's actually going in and creating my reality here. I'm creating my reality. What I expect of my team is what I'm going to get. What I expect of myself is what I'm going to get. The calls that are made, the leads that are bought, the systems I use, all intentional and all rooted back to trying to achieve this one target. And you can always backtrack, right? If, if you don't hit the target right out of the gate, it's not like you failed. It's like what you tried failed. So go back and reevaluate. What's another way I could solve this problem? And so you got to keep your energy high. You want to perform at a high level like that. It, the priorities can't be about how much are you going to soak up from the business in the next 30 days to pay your bills. And I know we've all been there, right? We've all been there probably at times, but it's got to be about something much bigger, right? No, nobody's writing $3 million in new business in a year. I'm talking to a guy right now, I'll write 5.5 new, uh, new business this year. Nobody's doing that without intention. They're not accidentally falling into that. That is very intentional. There is a plan behind that. There is a science behind that. So I think the longer you spend being scientific about it and creating that plan, the more you look back on the days you didn't plan and go like, what was I, how did I ever expect to hit a target? And I just wasn't in tune with my business. So 
you know, be willing, be willing to look at yourself in the mirror and say, what, what can I do better? What, what am I not tracking right now? What am I not willing to face? And usually that's the place that you want to run to. The things that you don't want to face are actually the areas that'll free up time, energy, performance, et cetera. So I want to open it up for questions. I appreciate you guys hanging on an extra 12 minutes with me uh, today. And I will send out the recording for anybody that wasn't able to stick through the, uh, the whole session. But are there any questions before we wrap up? If there's not, um, I'm going to drop my contact information down in here. And if anybody wants to take me up on any offers that were made today in terms of support, training, anything like that, uh, please just you know reach out to me. This is my email and my cell phone. And then also we're running a, a 30 to 50% discount plus some huge value ads for the next 18 hours or something here at Team Hired for, uh, for August. And they, they finish up end of Thursday. So if any of you are in a position where you want to do some, some hiring right now and you want our, our support, potentially just reach out to me. I can walk through those with you. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, ben, thank you for the last comment there. Uh, it's my pleasure. And it's been an awesome three years at Team Hired. I, I look forward to many, many more. And I hope everyone has a strong month and close out. Um, any feedback you have after, after this, please just send it my way. I'll look for that. But otherwise, have an incredible month and close out for August. Keep pushing. And thank you so much for being here.